Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you for joining us for today's special event from Scality and HPE. Entitled Making the Future of Data Possible, this is a special launch event where you're going to learn about some brand new products and capabilities from Scality and HPE. Before we get started, there's a number of housekeeping items we'd like to cover. I'll be making some introductions here shortly to who your speakers will be today, and we have a great lineup. If you have questions, we have answers. Please make sure you, you use the QA button in your console if you have any question at all for any of today's speakers during any segment of today's event. If you ask a great question, it could be worth $50. We'll talk about that on the next slide. You'll also notice on the handouts tab, there are a number of documents for you to review. We encourage you to download all of those handouts and read them in their entirety. There's great content where you'll learn more about what Scality and HPE are bringing to market, as well as about storage in general. We also have a number of great prizes for today's event that I'll talk about shortly. As I mentioned, if you ask a great question, it could be worth $50. We will be reviewing all of the questions after today's event and choosing the one that, in our opinion, is the best question. If you ask the best question, we will send you a $50 gift card and we'll reach out to you after today's event. You do have to meet the terms of Actual Tech Media's prize policy, which you can find on the handouts tab in your console. At the end of today's event also, let me go to, go to the right slide, I apologize. We'll also be giving away a $300 Amazon gift card as well as a server that we'll be sending to a lucky winner at the end of this second portion of today's event. As I mentioned, we have a number of fantastic speakers in today's event. We'll be hearing first from Jerome Lacat, who is the CEO and founder of Scality. Also, Paul Spachali, who is the Chief Product Officer with Scality. Carol Bassett, Senior Worldwide Market Product Manager for HPE. And Chris Powers, Vice President and General Manager of HPE. This is going to be a little bit of a different kind of event. We've partnered with Tech Field Day for the second half of today's event. During the Tech Field Day portion of today's event, you hear from Can Candida Volwa, who is the field CTO for Scality, James Governor, co-founder and analyst for Redmonk, Stephen Foskett, organizer and chief for Tech Field Day, and Joey D'Antoni, principal consultant for DCAC. And with that, we're gonna kick it off with our first introduction to what we're talking about today. Today, digital transformation has unleashed a tidal wave of unstructured data, technological solutions, and overwhelming complexity. More than ever, organizations are in need of partners to help them navigate, compete, and thrive in these new environments. Scality has built its reputation on helping its clients adapt, learn, and grow through these changes. From protected to propelled, we believe your data should always be secure and available. We also see data as a means to fuel your business, to implement solutions seamlessly in your day-to-day, -day, optimizing the way you progress, to build your company's future with absolute confidence. From us to you. We're co-creators who co-build products and services relentlessly, building new solutions and experiences together, committed to making it work. A chemistry of success we've developed for the last 10 years. From today to tomorrow, we design products to solve today's generation of problems, but also to ensure these solutions last for many digital generations to come, to embrace the future with vision and drive together, making the path radically long-term and future-proof. From scaling data to the art of scale, Scality. I am pleased to pre present to you Jerome Lacat, CEO, Scality. Ladies and gentlemen, today's a big day. I'm grateful to all of you. Our customers, our team members, our partners, our shareholders, technology enthusiasts, and socially responsible individuals. You, the six arrows of the Skeleton logo, thank you for being here with us. From San Francisco to New York, to London, to Paris, to Berlin, all the way to Tokyo and even Australia, there's more than a thousand people right now together on this live event. Thank you also Actual Tech Media and Gestalt IT to helping us putting this event together. 
Thank you to everyone who's helped us make this day a big day. Skeleti has reached a new milestone. A new era is opening. After 10 years as a storage innovator, we are rolling out the art of scale concept. Art really, for us, is a mix of mastery and creativity. May I say also that it has an element of mystery, or may I say even wizardry? Art is complicated, and art delivers great outcome in the world. Scale. Scale is the experience and the know-how of the infinitely big and the infinitely small. Scale are these hyperscalers building huge clouds around the planet. IT cloud. Scale is also the infinitely small and what we are going to see with edge computing in smaller and smaller devices. Out of scale is really who we are and who we want to be for the world. Out of scale is us mixing our experience gathered through hard work over the past 10 years with the creativity of our team to bring better infrastructure for the good of humanity. Together, we co-create with our customers and with our partners to deliver this outcome. Digital transformation is here. It's changing every one of our lives. It really started 15 years ago with consumer IT. As consumers, we've seen our life change with the smartphone, with the movies, with the entertainment industry, with healthcare. Every part of our lives as individual and citizen is changing. This change is really fueled by cloud technologies. Cloud technology is the combination of automation with software defined infrastructure. Cloud really started in 2006 when Amazon introduced the S3 storage, simple storage service. It was really designed by the engineers of Amazon, Facebook, and Google, who saw that there was a way to deliver better IT, higher performance, higher reliability for a lower cost with distributed infrastructure deployed on good servers and standard servers. A new wave is here. Because we've learned a lot since 2006, all of us as an industry and our skeleton as a company. Also because with the advent of Kubernetes, which is now mature enough to be production scale, we have a very powerful automation framework. Today, all our life is digital. Having optimal IT for any enterprise or any public service makes the difference. Digital life means really data-driven life. And data seems like a very vague concept, very far away from our life, but really data is everything that touches us. It's the medical image that saves a life. It's an art display in a virtual museum. It's the security cameras that keep us safe. It's the digital twin that can predict the malfunction of an engine. It's the backup that protects us from ransomware. Everything is data. And data may be created, processed, replicated really anywhere. At the edge, in the core data center, and in the public cloud. You know, edge is not only a smartphone. Edge is also an MRI machine in a remote hospital. Edge is a car, a train, an airplane, a factory, a cell phone tower, or even the International Space Station. Our lives and business processes are becoming digital. New applications are being built. Applications that need to handle more and more data. AI, machine learning, big data analysis in memory database are becoming part of our life and virtually part of every business process. These applications are built cloud native. They rely on Kubernetes automation. They expect fast and reliable access to data wherever the data is. The cloud native era needs adaptability, portability, and adaptability. Attributes that traditional storage systems struggle to match. 
For 50 years, we've been living in a world of infrastructure-centric IT, a world of silos, a world of difficult technology refresh. A new era is here, the world of application-centric IT. So we listened. We co-created with our customers and with our partners. We started from scratch four years ago to design storage for the cloud-native application-centric era. And we're launching today this new generation of object storage. For us, it's a really big thing. It's the biggest announcements in 10 years since we launched the Ring 10 years ago. We're very proud of our Ring. It's a leading product in its category. Ring is an amazing object store for traditional workload. But what we are announcing today is the ultimate object storage for the new era, a product that is both simple and powerful, both built for long term and adaptable. It's not just about storage. It's really encompassing the edge, the core data center, and the public cloud all in one. Data is everywhere. For this product launch, we've decided to partner with HP. We chose HP because we're like minded because HPE also sees that the future of IT is different. It is app-centric, it is cloud-native, it is as a service, and we both want our customers to do more for the benefit of humanity. In a few minutes, Paul Speciali, our Chief Product Officer, will unveil our new creation. But before this, I would like to introduce you to my friend and partner, Chris Powers. Chris is Vice President and General Manager Collaborative Platform and Big Data at HP. He has been instrumental in helping us co-create this revolutionary software. Chris, on to you to share your vision of what's coming. Thank you, Jerome. It's a pleasure to join you here today. I couldn't agree more that it's time we pivot and, a, and adapt our approach to data. It's critical we do so as digital transformation has become a business imperative. Increasingly, data is the chief asset of every organization. To survive and thrive today, enterprises need to fully extract the business value of their data and do so with velocity to stay ahead of their competition. In order to accomplish this, organizations are continuing to accelerate their adoption of cloud native tools in order to develop and deploy the emerging workloads, many of which Jerome mentioned. Cloud native gives them the speed and agility their businesses need and gives them the ability to mine their data for insight and value. The old or traditional way of approaching data management has inhibited our customers' progress in many ways. We've heard from many of our customers the challenges they face in transforming their businesses with cloud native application. Too often, storage infrastructure complexity, decentralized fragmented data, both result in lost productivity and escalating costs. For years, object storage has been a solution best suited for secondary workloads, primary backup or archival use cases. However, the object storage of old is no longer sufficient to support this new generation of data intensive application. Quite simply, a new approach is needed. Organizations shouldn't have to care about the underlying infrastructure anymore. It should be easily deployed and provisioned automatically. Data needs to be portable across multiple clouds, private and public, accessed quickly and processed wherever it lives, whether in the cloud, the data center, or on the edge. Our desire to find that new way forward, that new approach, is what prompted us to expand our years-long successful partnership with Scalar. Collectively, we want to address the spectrum of cloud-native application development challenges, 
from pilot projects to enterprise production environments. Together, we are laser focused on solving the greatest data challenges across the globe. HPE and Scality together are building sustainable storage infrastructures that adapt as rapidly as technology changes. This is how HPE and Scality are partnering, enabling data intensive cloud native applications and workloads to achieve fast access to object storage that's built on NVMe. Modern object storage is here. And now I'd like to turn it over to Paul to give us a more detailed look at our Tesca. Take it away, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanna thank Jerome, Chris, and Scott, and hello everyone. I really wanna welcome you all to our launch event. It's super great to have you all here. And I wanna start by first echoing Jerome, this, that this is a really big, important, and great day for us here at Scality. The entire team here is excited to have you here as we announce our new product. This product is really the culmination of over a decade of our collective experiences. Over that time, we've gathered a mass of learnings from collaborating with our customers to solve some really, really hard data problems. Many of these customers were among the largest enterprises, government institutions, and service providers across the globe. In that time, we've also gained highly valued partnerships, such as that one with HPE, our key partner in this launch. Now, with that said, we should observe that we are now at an inflection point in the market. This is really being driven by new workloads and application modernization. This is the thing that's unfolding that we're calling the cloud native era. On top of that, we also have to see that we have a wave of new technologies, new APIs, a rich application and cloud ecosystem. We believe that all of this indeed calls for a new approach to storage and data management, one that really sort of intrinsically fits into this new model. And within that context, we are now thrilled to announce our new product, Artesca. Artesca is a cloud native, a lightweight cloud native object storage solution. I have the pleasure of presenting this first introduction to you now. It has been in development for four years and it's an entirely new storage stack and code base. It's really been designed and implemented as cloud native software itself. Uh, that means that it's distributed services at all layers of the stack. That's from the management control plane to the data services, to the storage services. This of course means that it lives on Kubernetes. It's deployed on and orchestrated on Kubernetes. It's also designed to broaden the range of users that can deploy and operate this solution with a real focus on application and DevOps teams. That's been our real focus from an ease of use perspective. Now with HPE, we've had a great partner here. So HPE will offer our Tesca on an expanded product line of HPE servers, both for the data center and for the edge. And we'll all be followed by Carol Bassett, who will describe that in more detail. But first, let's get going with more description about our Tesca. So the first thing we have to understand is that we're putting a big premise on object storage here. We believe in object storage. We've seen it now for over a decade. And we really believe that object storage is the future since it has all of the right ingredients for these cloud native workloads. The first is that we all know it's scalable. It's had that advantage since the beginning. It also provides API based access, which is really a natural way for cloud native applications to interact with other services. Add to that, that it's portable. It can be accessed anywhere. It's now available on premises, of course, in the cloud and on the edge. So this kind of access through APIs and for cloud data management through APIs makes object storage a really great fit. It's also very efficient. We find that we can provide lightweight deployments that can start small and scale very smoothly, organically and incrementally. This also means that it can be deployed in more places. For example, if we can put it on the edge, we can open up a whole new class of edge use cases. Ultimately, we believe that this offers all the right balance of things like scale, portability, and even speed, as we'll talk about next here, to really make it the right fit for cloud native applications. So let's dig in a little bit deeper. Uh, I've introduced this descriptive line, lightweight cloud native object storage software. So let's talk about the three elements. What do we mean by lightweight? There's a few different thrusts to that. The first is that it's super easy to deploy. 
In fact, we've made a radical change here. It, rather than forcing a start as a clustered system, you can start with a single server on very low capacities. This means a developer could start with a few tens of terabytes. We could use it at 50 to 200 terabytes on the edge, and we can grow it very, very simply by, a, by adding a single server at a time. Secondly, it's super easy to operate. We don't assume any Linux operating system expertise or any deep storage administrator expertise. Super easy as you start and as you grow. Next, I mentioned that it has a cloud native architecture. It is indeed Kubernetes based for all of its deployment and operations, but cloud goes further than that. For us, it also includes a multi-cloud namespace, which I'll demonstrate, I'll show you some of the user interface. Uh, it provides a namespace that spans across on-premise and public clouds. It provides extensible metadata, metadata search, and really very powerfully data management workflows across all of those storage backends. Ultimately for us, this is really all about the application. We think about this as an application centric product. What does it mean? It means it needs to be fast. It needs to be performant. It also needs to provide all of the right APIs to really become the primary and only storage tier for these new and emerging workloads. So those are the three things that we're kind of anchoring around. Now, with that said, I think if we look at the market, it's very clear that there's a lot of offerings out there. Let me start with enterprise grade. We think enterprise grade has obviously been available for many years. The real uniqueness in Arteska is providing both a lightweight architecture and system with all of the enterprise grade features that you expect to really go into production. Okay, and what do we mean by enterprise grade capabilities? Well, it's all of the things that you expect in terms of security. So let me start with multi-tenancy. Our Tesca is designed at the start to be a multi-tenant uh, system. So that means that you can have multiple applications, use cases, user communities, all access accessing the system in a very secure manner. In fact, we emulate the Amazon identity and access management uh, system to provide this kind of multi-tenancy. That extends to authentication, access control, and all of the different policies that you want to enact for multi-tenancy to really keep things securely isolated. Next, in a few minutes, I'll describe a data durability capability that we've introduced into our Tesca that we think is really groundbreaking. This is a dual level data protection mechanism that makes both a single server highly durable, and as you scale out, it adds a distributed uh, data protection capability that protects the cluster as you grow. Ultimately, providing all the right tools to the DevOps teams and the enterprise IT folks that really need to manage this is the key, right? And that starts with fitting into the enterprise ecosystem, things like load balancers and uh, making sure that switches can connect properly, and really to give you all the power to monitor that through a single pane of glass. That single pane of glass UI that we've designed for Artesca is brand new, and it also encompasses this multi-cloud data workflow management and metadata search that I introduced. So in a minute or so, I'll, start, I'll give you a quick tour of that user interface. And then in our second hour, I'll be joined by, by Candida, my colleague, and we'll give you a deeper dive into that UI. So just to motivate a little bit more about the type of applications that we're seeing emerge here that we think are a great use. We've certainly mentioned Edge as a new and emerging area. We're starting to see a lot of deployments that depend on a lightweight, small footprint storage solution for example, imagine a manufacturing environment where you might have a lot of cameras deployed around a factory floor. These might be only a few tens of terabytes initially. Uh, it's very important for them to have that light footprint and also to be remotely monitorable and managed. Uh, secondly, big data analytics. We've certainly seen an emergence of things like deployments for Splunk and Vertica and Elastic and Weka over the last years. This is an entirely different type of workflow from a performance perspective for object storage. It's much more data intensive. The workload, the payload data types can be small and large, and there's a lot more demand on random IO than object storage experienced in the past. And of course, not a day goes by that none of that we don't hear about artificial intelligence and machine learning. These are very compute intensive tasks. They tend to be in memory, but they really benefit from fast storage to be able to load data quickly into memory and to perform their processing. Over time, we expect more and more workloads to really fit this model. 
core cloud services, media and entertainment, video broadcast delivery. So again, we've designed our test cut to start small, but grow gracefully over time. We see three audiences here. Application owners are gonna make so many decisions for these types of workloads that we've just talked about. They will pull in architects and developers and DevOps teams to help operate and deploy the infrastructure. And of course, on the edge, that'll require a lot of talent, but we see an edge solution builder community that can really benefit from this. So that's the application workloads. I wanna spend the next just few minutes giving you a quick tour of our Tesca's brand new user interface. So again, it's a multi-cloud namespace, and I'll give you kind of a quick outline of the different layers that we have here. So at the top, one of the things that we wanted to do was to really provide very simple at a glance health metrics. So what's an example of a health metric? One of the things you really care about is how well your data is protected, right? If you're gonna store even 10 terabytes or whether it's 20, 10 petabytes or 20 petabytes, you need to know that it's fully protected. Our Tesca constantly monitors the data health. If something fails in the background, perhaps a component, it will perform self-healing, but the administrator is always informed about the status of how far you're protected back up to the nominal state. I mentioned data workflows, things like replication to cloud and lifecycle management. All of those are also monitored and provide, uh, you're provided with a quick at a glance status of where you are in those replication and lifecycle tasks. Uh, our Tesca can also discover data from external data sources. So imagine you have some data in an Amazon bucket. We can discover that, we can bring it into the namespace and now it can be managed within this UI. So very, very powerful. I mentioned multi-tenancy. So there's this idea of having a data service in our Tesca. You can have one or more of them. It provides a logical endpoint, a separation from, the net, from a network perspective for your application. So for example, I can set one up for a backup app or an analytics app and so on. And that really provides me with a starting point for this secure multi-tenant tenancy that I described earlier. The next layer down really gets into the multi-cloud capabilities. So these are the storage services supported in our Tesca. Of course, our Tesca itself provides a highly durable storage layer. So you can see here that I have our Tesca locally. I can also have different our Tesca instances remotely, and I wanna be able to monitor those here. For our Scality customers, those that use the ring, of course you can view the Scality ring instances, whether they're local or remote here. And then as we've talked about public clouds, Amazon, Azure, Google, Wasabi, they're all supported. And we're even working on interfaces to tape and to Amazon Glacier. We know that there's a lot of dormant and cold data out there that benefits from that. Now, many software defined storage systems sort of ignore the fact that there's a platform to run on. And we don't. With our Tesco, we go super deep. And that means that we understand intrinsically that under the covers, there's a Kubernetes layer. There is a hardware, physical hardware layer. So we can monitor the hardware from a server perspective, the disks, we always perform disk scrubbing for bit rot protection. And ultimately you can view all of that by clicking down and you have a view on local and remote data centers. So we logically separate those. And again, in the next hour, please make sure to join us because we'll show you a deeper tour of the user interface. I wanna elaborate on a few more things here. The first is this idea of multi-cloud data management. So what does it mean? So essentially there are built-in policies that help you easily mobilize your data. Let me give you an example. I may have a number of our Tesca instances as shown here on the diagram deployed in perhaps a remote location. These are ideal to capture data where it's being processed. And perhaps you wanna store that data for 30 days, 60 days, but then you wanna bring it to some central site. Okay? And that central site might be a core data center or it might be a public cloud. Those instances of Artesca have the ability to set policies for expiring data, tiering their data, which essentially means moving it, or replicating that data between the source and the target. Replication can be multi-way. So I can say, put a copy in my data center and in my cloud. And of course it can even span multiple clouds. This also gets into metadata. Metadata is a big mechanism for enriching data. Essentially, it means that you can tag your data objects with extensible attributes that describe the data. For example, on something like a camera, I may want to identify the camera ID so that I know where it's located. Once I've added that type of metadata, either programmatically or through the user interface, I can search on it. So it makes access to data super easy 
to basically say, find me all objects that are created on Tuesday, as an example. Finally, I mentioned external data discovery. The ability to import data once from an external data source and to keep the namespace consistent as applications update these external data sources. For example, you may have an application talking directly to an Amazon bucket. We can manage notifiers that are out of band updates and maintain the Arteska namespace up to date in an eventually consistent manner. Okay, so very, very powerful federated cloud data management capabilities. On the topic of enterprise grade, I think we've all in the storage industry heard a lot about analytics. This is a very, very important topic because it gets into how my system is utilized. How is it performing? Uh, Arteska provides a very comprehensive analytics capability. It provides uh, essentially at four levels. I can understand how my system is consuming storage at the system level, account level, user level, and bucket level. And this is both for storage consumption and for performance. For example, how much bandwidth per unit time is going into a certain bucket or from a certain user. So those are really powerful. Uh, ultimately, this gets visualized in the UI as sort of trend line graphs. You can set alerts to be able to be informed when uh, capacity is hitting a certain threshold so that you're prepared for your next uh, growth increment. So that really gets into capacity planning. Uh, the last thing I really wanna talk about from a technology perspective is data durability. No storage system can forego data durability. Our Tesca has thought about this for years as part of our design process. And ultimately, there's a big change happening that has forced us to innovate. And that innovation is related to the high density of disks and the high dens increasing density of servers. So what we do in our Tesca is essentially protect data on two layers. One is at the local server level. We compute local parity information so that if a disk drive fails locally, we can repair it fast without ever going over the network. We also distribute parity across the servers if you have a cluster as you grow. So this provides distributed data protection in the face of something like a server failure. Now, the real innovation here is that the combination of both of these two erasure coding and data protection levels is very low. It's very efficient. In fact, in some configurations, it's even lower than standard distributors, distributed erasure coding than we used in the past. So that's a real, real value because it can end up saving you many, many terabytes. So I wanna wrap up this quick tour with a couple of kind of summary notes. I talked a lot about customer benefits, right? Starting small, growing easily, but really it's all about the application, right? We wanted to build this for the applications that you're bringing out to make sure that it's not just for the first part of your deployment. It also will live with you. It has all of the enterprise grade capabilities that you expect from big traditional storage systems, but now in this lightweight form factor. By putting this on Kubernetes, what have we done? We've made it possible to put this anywhere that data is created, from core to cloud to edge. That's really the mantra here. It's based on game-changing technology. This integrated cloud data management, the, the fact that we have a completely containerized, uh, container-based architecture means we can really run anywhere. And then this innovation in providing this dual-level data protection strategy to protect single and multiple servers. Ultimately, our design philosophy is to be sustainable and adaptive. It's not just about hardware technology, it's also about sustaining clouds as they emerge and change and APIs. So to really take your data into the future. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Carol Bassett, who's gonna to talk to you more about HPE storage server announcements. Carol. Great, thank you, Paul. Hi, everyone. HPE is thrilled today to partner with Scality in this announcement of Arteska. But before I show you the new HPE systems, I wanna share some of what we've learned from our customers that helped us define our new portfolio. We've been selling Scality Ring for quite a few years on our density optimized Apollo 4000 systems. But we've seen a lot of interest from customers who are asking us for all flash solutions so that they can get performance for more cloud native workloads. <clears throat> And with flash prices continuing to drop, there's motivation to start using flash now. This paper from ESG Insights provides a good view of what many customers are thinking. The full paper is available for you today in the handouts, but I can share some of the key points with you right now. 
ESG interviewed over 200 IT professionals. The data they collected confirmed what we're hearing. It's the new data intensive workloads and digital initiatives that are driving the demand for all flash object storage. But the number one takeaway from the ESG report is that the majority of people view this technology as a game changer. Now, people don't change just because there's something new. They change when they see real business results. So to find out how customers were measuring results, ESG asked how well all flash object storage was delivering on their business metrics. The graphic here confirms users are seeing real business benefits from accelerated development to more application performance to better resource utilization. The final insight was learning that customers ranked data protection and reliability just as important as performance. We believe that means reliability in both the software and the storage platform you deploy it on. So with the new trends driving demand for all flash and a new scality solution that offers more choice, HPE has tripled the size of our portfolio. On the left are the cap capacity optimized Apollo 4000 systems that we've been selling for many years with our scality solutions. They're a great way to build petabyte scale archive capacity and they use hybrid storage. We have these systems in production today with multi petabytes per customer. In the middle are our three new flashed optimized solutions. First in line is an all QLC flash using the Apollo 4200 server. QLC flash offers a lower price point and will have very long endurance when used with object storage systems. And that can really help make all flash object storage more economical for data centers with large scale cloud native data lakes and in-memory applications. But for customers who want top flash performance, we have two new all NVMe platforms. The first is a scalable single node Proliant DL325 Gen 10 Plus system. It supports up to 18 drives and a single one new server. It delivers performance and capacity at any scale. It can start with just a single node and grow to any size. It's a great choice for growth and high performance for cloud native applications and online analytics workloads. The second is a cluster in a box solution based on the Apollo N2600. This one holds 20 drives in a single 2U chassis. It's a good choice for DevOps and edge to cloud data infrastructure. And since all these systems support Arteska and the new low entry points, you don't have to buy a petabyte worth of equipment just to get all flash object storage. And finally, on the right, we offer the Proliant DL380 server for smaller capacity sizes using low cost hybrid storage in remote office situations where you don't need a rack full of equipment. All of these systems can be configured with up to 100 gigabit ethernet networking and every one of them can be deployed as a single system starting with just 50 terabytes of usable capacity using Scality's new Arteska software. And with the market trends, driving towards using object storage with new use cases for performance and edge deployment. Our new portfolio offers the choices to fit everything from terabytes to petabytes with a wide range of media options. And that wraps it up. So let me turn the meeting back over to Scott. Thank you everyone for staying tuned in as we learned about our Tesca from both HPE and Scality. We're now gonna have a Q&A period where we're gonna have all of our speakers come back in. That includes Jerome, Chris, Paul, and Carol. And we're gonna have a Q&A session. So give us a second while we bring everybody in and here we are. We have a number of questions that have come in from the audience. And Jerome, I'm gonna direct the first one to you because we've, it's been asked a couple of times. What is the relationship between Ring and Arteska? Ring and Arteska are two different products and they will both co continue to live and evolve. Ring is really focused on traditional enterprise IT. Ring is both an object store and a scale out NAS. 
and it has a lot of bells and whistles that are necessary for traditional enterprise IT. Different, Arteska is really a lightweight cloud native object store. It has a different target in terms of use case and audience and way to operate. Paul, I'm going to ask the next question um, to you. This is sort of a follow up to what um, was just asked, but how do our test get and ring interact with each other um, in the with the with the new with the multi I guess with the deployment of both? Yeah, that's a great question. So we see a very good fit for Arteska and Ring together in this edge to core type of use case. We've certainly made it possible to mobilize data between the two platforms. So I mentioned the edge use case for Arteska, staging data on the edge for some period of time, filtering it, and then perhaps replicating or tiering that data back to a central data center. That central data center can have Ring, so Ring can be a target for any of the workflow policies in Arteska. And by the way, we should say vice versa. So you really get super powerful capabilities. But we think Ring is an ideal solution for that big core data center where perhaps you have many workloads with these data workflows from the edge. Um, the next question is for, oh, go ahead, Jerome, I apologize. Yeah, let me add, really Ring uh, has uh, something very strong is that within one Ring cluster, you can deploy many, many applications. We have customers deploying over a hundred different applications, uh, either as object, as object store or as a scale out NAS on the same big Ring cluster. Uh, at Tesca, we expect will be more de uh, deployed for a uh, single or a bunch of applications that are coherent together. So it, it's a different approach. Our next question is for one of the HPE folks. Um, the question is, what's the smallest minimum capacity on the HPE server lineup and on which server model does that minimum capacity exist? The minimum capacity will be 50 terabytes of usable capacity, and that's available on every single one of the systems I showed you today. Excellent. Um, next question. Um, how does the solution protect against a ransomware attack? That's probably a Paul question, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, let me take that one. So there's been a lot of thinking in the industry around ransomware protection. It gets quickly into data immutability. Uh, one of the great things about the Amazon S3 API is that it now supports a feature called object lock. It's actually a set of APIs that really make the data immutable. You can't change it, you can't overwrite it. Once it's been written, uh, we support that in our Tesco. We support that also in Ring. Uh, and that means that pr uh, data protection backup applications can make use of that as they store data in our, in our Tesco to really make sure the data is locked down and can't be tampered with. Our next question, um, this is for you, Jerome. Why is the new name our Tesco? What does it mean? Arteska is really to uh, resound like uh, what, what's really the core of the company, which is the art of scale. Okay. Um, next question is for Chris. Do the HPE servers in the lineup support QLC Flash? I'm actually going to pass that over to Carol. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yes, we support QLC Flash. Our philosophy is to not lock you into some appliance model where you don't have any choices. So HPE offers NVMe flash, QLC flash, TLC flash, and we're particularly pleased with, show, with able, being able to offer you QLC flash drives on the Apollo 4200 server. That's our big scale data lake can be all flash with the economics of QLC. Okay, I have a relatively long question, so please bear with me. How is your API for management of Arteska? Pulling data out of Arteska for administration and management of Arteska is key since we all have done, since we all have other management systems. Meaning, can everything I do in our, the Arteska UI be done via an API? Yeah, I can take that one, Scott. So yes, the answer is absolutely yes. We totally understand and we've heard, by the way, because we've done a lot of design interviews with customers and prospects and they tell us two things, right? You have to make everything consumable for the human user, but also for tooling. And tooling expects to have API-based access to everything, monitoring, management, configuration. 
So that means scripts and consoles and whatever you build can essentially access the system's information and control it through an API-based method. We think it's absolutely imperative to have that for this new world of cloud native. Uh, next question is for uh, Carol or Chris. Will Arteska support edge line servers from HPE for the industrial edge? Not at this launch. Um, one of the things that you have to consider when you're building an object storage solution is you need to provide a minimum number of drives and minimum amount of capacity. And we might use that later with the edge line products, but uh, this, it, this portfolio that we can show you today that we tripled in size is what we're gonna drive out with for this uh, next half. All right, um, Paul, what Kubernetes distributions does Arteska support? Okay, that's a really great question. I'm glad somebody asked that. So again, we've designed this for general deployment on Kubernetes, but from a practical perspective, you have to start somewhere. So we've really started with three. Uh, the first is Metal Kubernetes, which is our own distribution. Uh, it's hardened, it's tested, it's ready to go, and it's been used for many years. The next two that are really, really coming up now, obviously with our partnership with HPE, the uh, HPE Esmeral container platform, it's something that our joint customers are already deploying, uh, and it's something that we have running today, and we expect that to be validated very soon, like in the next few weeks. Uh, the one after that that's getting a lot of attention in the industry is VMware Kanzu. We're running on that today, but again, there's this validation process uh, that we need to step through before it's officially supported. After that, the world is quite open. We're looking at things like OpenShift from IBM Red Hat. Uh, there's uh, Google's Anthos, and those will base on customer demand. But we think that those are the kind of the top five uh, that we need to support out of the gate. Um, next question is, what is the pricing model for our Tesca? Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> so our Tesca, like Ring, is, based, is sold based on unique, usable terabytes of capacity. So not on raw, but based on usable. So we can build out um, all the hardware you need to provide the data durability you need, but your licensing will be unique, usable. Very good. Um, this is a Paul question. Does Arteska, and you answered this to a point earlier, does Arteska support advanced features of the S3 API, such as versioning, object locking, multi-part upload, and more? Yeah, it's a good question. It is kind of a follow-on. So uh, we have to think about what are the advanced features, right? Amazon introduces new features all the time in the S3 API. Uh, around the Amazon reInvent conference, there's always some new ones. We've implemented the ones that really matter, and it's a huge set of them, right? Things like versioning replication, which they call cross-region replication, bucket lifecycle management, object locking, but there's so many more. You can think about even multi-part upload as another uh, very advanced capability. You have to do it right and you have to do it efficiently. So our approach is really to look at the APIs, to understand what customers want to use and to implement them very quickly so that we stay super current. But today it's a huge set of uh, all of the advanced APIs. All right, next question. Does the single pane of glass management extend to a scality ring that is providing archival storage and does the namespace extend to an existing, existing ring? Yes, it absolutely does. Scality ring, you know, for us, it's a no brainer to support that in the Arteska UI. Um, actually stay tuned because in the next session, we'll go deeper into the user interface. Um, but absolutely, part of the multi-cloud namespace is both to have on-prem systems and public cloud and Ring is certainly the core of our attention when it comes to on-premises. All right, uh, next question. Um, how does, uh, sorry, it, how does Arteska complement Ring and XDM offerings? I think you may have answered this, but I wanna at least answer it a little bit differently. How does the Arteska complement the Ring and XDM offerings today and into the longer term future? Okay, maybe I can start on that one and Jerome, you can chime in. I think the elements of our previous answer, answer apply. You know, the ability to mobilize data is really what customers have asked us for for many years, right? Up until about four years ago, we were primarily focused on on-premises, but customers came to us and said, really, we need a solution that unlocks that data and, and can kind of integrate it with the public cloud, right? We introduced capabilities in Ring to be able to do things like 
hybrid cloud archiving. I might want to take my dormant data off of the ring and put it up in the public cloud. Or data DR, disaster recovery, another copy of the data for DR purposes in a public cloud. So Ring provides those capabilities. Artesca provides them in an integrated fashion. And that really kind of gives this bi-directional capability to move data around appropriately between edge deployments and core deployments. I think that's, that's kind of where we see the synergy between the two. Um, this is the next question that I think will have an interesting answer for the person who asked it because uh, it actually goes a little smaller. Um, can we start with two nodes and build a small dual site solution that can that sync replicate? So basically, what are some of the deployment models that are common, um, uh, commonly available? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy somebody asked that because we I sort of omitted answering it. So replication is not only, you know, Artesca to public cloud or Artesca to a foreign data source. You absolutely can have an Artesca replicating to another Artesca. Those could be fairly close. They could be geographically apart. It is an asynchronous replication model. We follow very closely the Amazon S3 CRR API, cross-region replication, with the difference that not only can we replicate one-to-one, -one, but we can also say multi-location, multi-target replication. But yes, two nodes replicating between the two fully supported. Uh, next question, is there a CSI driver for, for provisioning Artesca from Kubernetes? Uh, let me take that one because that one has is a little bit nuanced. So CSI is the container storage interface. Uh, it's something that's been pretty well embraced now for the last two years, but it's really applicable to block and file storage. It's for automated provisioning of block and file volumes. It does not apply to object storage. Okay. For object storage, we're looking for alternate interfaces for provisioning object storage. There is one uh, formulating right now within the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF. They have a Kubernetes storage, uh, storage group that's formulating a specification called COSI, C-O-S-I for Container Object Storage Interface. We expect that specification to be solid very soon, and we'll support that as soon as the spec is solid. Sounds good. Um... Let's see. Okay. For the remote use case, what is the smallest amount of storage that Artesca can start at, whether that's, um, you know, in sort of a QA and test or production environment? Maybe. Yeah, I, so I, I think, think oh. sure, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, so, the, so technically the product can start really, really small. I mean, you could provision small volumes, gigabyte level, and it would work. Um, the question is, uh, you know, so so the, your question was for dev test. I mean, really as small as you want in the gigabyte level. It's when you get to production that we have a little bit more requirements because we want to be able to guarantee the enterprise grade, the reliability, uh, the fast access, and then we need uh, a little bit more hardware. Sounds good. I'm just making sure we've got all the questions. Um... I apologize. They're, they're in a couple of different places. So I'll make sure I get them all. <laughs> okay. How is your IAM API support for administrators compared to the feature, uh, I guess, the feature set of the UI? Um, I'm not quite, I'm not 100% sure exactly what he's asking there, but I, yeah. I think I'll he's take, asking. I'll, this I'll, take, I'll take this as well, if you don't mind. Really, the, sure. the way the product has been designed is that the UI is a layer on top of the API. So the answer is that it's exactly the same feature set. Okay. And that's what we would expect from a modern storage solution. So that's, I mean, everything is API driven. Um, is the HPE Scality offering available on GreenLake? Carol? Yes, absolutely. So we've been selling uh, 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 GreenLake um, scalability ring to customers for quite a few years now. And of course the Artesca solution will be included in that program as well. Excellent. Um, that is all of the questions we have from our audience. Thank you very much to our panel today. Um, we're going to move on with the next part of our event, which is going to be something a little bit different. Um, what will be happening shortly is our speakers will be transitioning to the Tech Field Day portion of today's event. For our audience, please make sure you stay. Um, you, we will be streaming the Tech Field Day portion of the event where we do a technical deep dive 
into the console you're watching right now. So don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. Um, we are going to give away an Amazon $300 gift card right now. And at the end of the Tech Field Day portion of the, today's event, we will be giving away a server, um, an HPE ProLiant server with, uh, for, for a lucky winner. Um, so the winner of the gift card is... Everything's slow sometimes. Ryan ha uh, Hannes from Pennsylvania. Ryan will be reaching out to you after today's event. Um, at the end of the next portion of the event, as I said, we'll be giving away um, a server. So please, to our actual tech media audience, please stay tuned. Um, we'll be, uh, I'll be provide, doing some uh, back and forth with Stephen Foskey here in just a second. And we'll see you on the, in the second half of today's event. Thank you to our audience for listening to those presentations from Scality and HPE. I'm happy now to be joined by Mr. Stephen Foskett, who is the publisher of Gestalt IT and the founder of Tech Field Day. Stephen, thanks for being here. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be here as usual with, uh, with you and the actual tech crew, and of course, the great folks from Scality and HPE who've brought in Tech Field Day to do the second half of this important announcement. Yeah, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. You and I are going to chat a little bit about what we just heard while the Tech Field Day delegates get prepared to listen to even more presentations from Skelly and HPE, and our audience will be able to continue to listen as well. We've learned a lot about what Scality is bringing to the world in partnership with HPE around Artesca. Um, we know it's a software-only solution, available as a subscription, it's object-based, has some interesting scaling opportunities from single node to lots of nodes, what are some of the thoughts that you have on what Scality has introduced and some of the challenges that they are trying to address with Artesca? I think the thing that to look out for here is uh, the things that you just mentioned. Number one, that it scales down really, really small. So this is a solution not just for massive, massive data sets, but for even smaller applications. To me, that's another uh, aspect of it that I'm really interested in, the fact that this is not just um, you know, archival storage or secondary storage. This is uh, you know, key storage for applications, you know, Kubernetes and cloud applications. And, and I think that the whole thing appears that it was developed just for that kind of use case so that somebody can you know, roll it out, um, start small, grow really, really big, of course, because this is scality after all. And to me, I think that this is interesting because it opens the door to a new market for Scality and a new market for their software. And it answers a need, I think, that we're seeing in the industry for a scalable object store for uh, next generation applications. I think those two things you just mentioned around new markets, two, two new markets that are important to discuss. One are smaller organizations. And the second are DevOps-centric environments that are really looking at Kubernetes and focusing on Kubernetes for modern application development. And in terms of small, I mean, a single node is pretty small. Um, as you would hope, though, they've continued to build good data protection in with, you know, you can lose a single disk in a single, in a single node, all the way out to what you'd expect from scale-out storage. One of the things that I like about their scale-out story is when you hear about a lot of scale-out platforms, there's an automatic rebalancing that happens to make sure that the, you know, all of the nodes are participating equally in the cluster. Scality has given people an option where you can add a node and just use that node, or you can add a node and go through the rebalancing process to get all of the IO from across the cluster later on as you've added that capacity. They brought up some interesting choices for, uh, for users to choose from um, in terms of how they grow their environments. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, some of the applications that are emerging, you know, some of the things we heard about were things like Splunk and AI, and so some of these very data-centric applications. Um, but one of the other things we heard about was Edge. What are some of your thoughts on where we're seeing growth at the Edge, and where do you see Artesca being a good, um, sort of a good choice for some of those Edge-centric environments? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the enterprise is no longer in the data center. Of course, we've moved to this hybrid cloud environment where you're, you know, in the data center and also in the cloud. Uh, a lot of enterprise applications are cloud centric and cloud native. And as we've heard with a lot of the recent announcements from the big players in the technology industry, companies like Intel and NVIDIA, the edge is a major uh, focus for the future of computing. More and more applications are being provisioned at the edge, more and more um, applications, especially like these, like um, 
monitoring and metrics and AI are exploding out of the data center. And those environments need to be able to start small. They need low footprint, low requirements, and then they need to be able to grow as data sets grow. And I think that that's another key to the platform here, as is, of course, the pricing model. I mean, you'd think that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not sure, you know, how the application is going to grow, what the data set's going to need, you know, you might want to have more of a subscription based pricing instead of a, uh, you know, go buy an appliance kind of pricing. Yeah, and that's interesting, especially in terms of the, the, the way that you can scale the environment with Edge. I mean, when you think about Edge, you're thinking about lots of little data centers, as you mentioned, sort of, in a way, um, and having these opportunities to start small in each of those Edge locations and grow bigger is pretty intriguing. Um, one of the other things that um, Scality is doing is they're making their license essentially free under, I can't remember exactly what the, what the capacity limit was, but it's 50 or 100 terabytes. So the software license will be free up to that point. You also have to deal with hardware, um, but it gets people um, an opportunity to be able to try it out and make sure it's gonna meet their needs, especially as they're looking at um, some of their development needs as they grow. Yeah, and this I think is really in keeping with this new market that we were talking about before. Um, many of these people, uh, you know, many of the ways that these applications come into the enterprise is through uh, open source applications mm -hmm. through uh, sort of a package of applications. And in many cases, people don't want to go through like a purchasing process. They just want to, you know, roll it out and see if it's for them. And by having uh, an application available right from the start, uh, basically try it, see if you like it. If you grow into it, then you can pay for it, I think is a really smart move for them, as is the partnership with HPE. And I think that's another thing that we really need to focus on here. Um, Enterprises uh, are buying a lot of gear from companies like HPE today. And frankly, having uh, that name associated with our test guy, I think really does uh, lend some real legitimacy to this product launch and to the product itself. Absolutely, and HPE is bringing a lot of different um, appliances, servers, you know, hardware um, uh, products to, to bear with our test guy. Um, all targeted at different scalability needs and a different, um, you know, capacity and density needs. Um, one of the things that I just looked, by the way, the, the capacity limit for the free license looks to be 100 terabytes. Um, but if you want support, Skelly will sell you the product starting at 50 terabytes is the way I, the way I understand it currently. I want to make sure I had that information accurate. Um, as we look at um, some of the... Um, I guess some of the application needs that are out there. Where are you seeing the biggest challenges people are having with data growth? Um, some of the what are some of the applications that are emerging that are causing some of the biggest challenges out there? Do you think? Yeah, this is an area that I'm really keen on because, of course, we do the AI field day and the utilizing AI podcast, and I think that you can tell from that what the applications that I'm thinking of are. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we're seeing the growth of machine learning and the application of machine learning causing an explosion of data growth, especially at the edge, at remote sites, at you know, factories or retail, at you know, industrial IoT. And all of these applications essentially are moving machine learning processing to the edge. And that's why you see a lot of companies in the hardware space developing machine learning uh, processors for those kind of spaces. But the, the challenge there, it's, it's kind of a strange thing. By moving machine learning to the edge, it means that you can collect more data, more sensor data, more applications, more objects. And that requires a scalable uh, infrastructure to support uh, in those kind of edge applications. So for me, when I'm looking at this, that was one thing that I really thought, you know, I bet that that would be an appropriate um, storage platform for an edge AI application. Similarly, I think we're seeing a lot more telemetry now in uh, enterprise tech space, uh, you know, whether it's in the network or in security. And of course, those things require a lot of storage too. And I think that that's really Absolutely. what our test goes for. Yeah, it's interesting that this has a lot of applicability inside IT. And, and uh, I know that the target is uh, sort of line of business applications, um, but there's a lot of potential for inside IT, especially with things like Splunk and, like you, as you mentioned, central telemetry from other systems. Um, the velocity and the uh, the variety and the the vastness of the volume of data is is increasing every year. Um, 
as we think about performance, you know, it becomes really important to make sure we can keep up. And as I mentioned before, um, Scality has allowed us to choose how we grow in a way that allows us to basically take a capacity-centric approach versus a more performance-centric approach um, based on how we rebalance data. But inside the system, they're also making use of things like QLC Flash and Spinning Disk to try to maximize the level of capacity and performance we get um, from the systems. Um, you know, do you have any thoughts around performance in terms of our Tesca and where um, Scality and HP are going with this? To be honest with you, um, my background is in storage, and I was deeply concerned with a system that starts out very small and starts out with one node and so on. But the fact that the people behind it are enterprise tech folks from Scality and from HPE it does reassure me quite a lot. Frankly, that's been a criticism that I've had of a lot of uh, sort of next generation cloud storage platforms is that they're developed by people who don't know anything about storage. They don't know about performance. They don't know about reliability. Well, this is Scality we're talking about here. I mean, this is a company that literally, um, I mean, that's, that's their thing. And so hopefully, um, you know, I would be more willing to trust a new storage platform from folks like them who've got a background in storage instead of, uh, you know, a devops -y, you know, next generation company that's never worked with data storage before. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I think that the uh, application of flash storage and uh, hybrid storage is a good story in keeping with what we're seeing overall. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's not like things are going to be, uh, you know, 100% disk based anymore anyway. I mean, flash is everywhere. So it's good that the application supports that. Yeah, I had similar concerns around single node. Um, obviously, Scality's taken all that into consideration with the way that they're um, providing data protection at the single node, at the single node level, with probably an expectation though, and I think a reasonable one, that as people grow, more nodes are gonna be required. Um, and they're gonna need to be able to have the additional resiliency you get from additional nodes in, the, in, a, in a more of a cluster type environment. Um, but it's, 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 I think it's good that they've, provided a single node option because there are some shops that are literally just that small that makes it great for even a test dev environment or even a small production environment um, you know with an understanding of where there's potential limitations um, but it's uh, it's it's so, sort of unusual to see an enterprise storage player going small um, but I really do think that particularly with their target on edge that it was really smart for them to do that um, because it provides an opportunity to get a toehold and then grow as needed Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think that that's really the great summary of what, uh, at least what it appears to be today uh, as of this launch. Um, to those of you watching, you know, we didn't get really, <laughs> uh, we're not on the development team, you know, we're both independent. And so we're watching and enjoying the launch along with you. And that's really what's going to happen next. So up next, we've got the Tech Field Day delegates uh, all queued up and ready to go to tune in for a, a different kind of presentation than the one you've just seen. First up, we're gonna have a deep dive into sort of the DevOps space. We've got some independent folks uh, who are gonna be coming in and talking about how applications are developed and deployed in modern times, modern applications, and give you some context for what Scality was looking for with the Artesca launch. After that, we're gonna do some uh, Tech Field Day style uh, demos and presentations and discussion of exactly what this means. And in order to facilitate that, we've invited in a panel of uh, independent technical influencers to discuss uh, the presentation live right in front of you. So essentially what you're gonna see here is you're gonna see uh, folks from Scality and folks that they brought in as guests presenting, and you're gonna see folks like uh, myself and Scott Lowe asking questions during the presentation right here on screen. If you'd like to participate, we would love to have you join us. Uh, you can tweet at us using hashtag TFDX or hashtag uh, ScalityXHPE. Uh, we'll be watching that on Twitter and we'll relay some of those questions into the room. But rest assured, even if you don't ask a question that way, we're gonna have the delegates uh, asking their own questions. And all of the people around the table that we've invited are folks who have real world hands-on IT experience and technical knowledge. And so they're going to be measuring and weighing what's being presented and uh, discussing that right here. We're going to finish up with what we're calling a Tech Field Day Roundtable discussion, which will be led by me, where we will be talking about the product, not just uh, you know me and Scott, but 
um, me and the Tech Field Day delegates and some of the folks from Scality and giving a deep dive into that product to learn more about it and to really get our questions answered. I hope that you enjoy these presentations and we'll be posting this afterwards to techfieldday.com and our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash techfieldday. So thank you very much, Scott and Actual Tech for the uh, morning's uh, presentations. And now let's transition into the Tech Field Day portion of the program. And before we go, please make sure to our audience, you don't leave. We'll be streaming the Tech Field Day portion live into the platform you're already in. If you have questions, please ask them using the questions panel in the console, and we will bring them current to, we'll bring them to someone in the room to answer during the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, one of the actual tech media audience uh, members will be winning a server from Skelly. So please stay tuned. Steven's gonna be up next with Tech Field Day. Welcome back uh, to the Tech Field Day portion of this morning's special launch event with Scality and HPE. Again, I'm Stephen Foskett. I've enjoyed the presentations we had this morning. And so now it's time to dive a little bit deeper. Those of you who aren't familiar with Tech Field Day, uh, expect that there will be questions and comments and discussion during the presentations here. And we're gonna wrap things up, as I said, with a, a special a roundtable discussion featuring all the folks involved with the launch, plus the Tech Field Day delegates. First, uh, let's get a quick recap of what we heard this morning from Paul Spicelli. All right, thank you, Stephen, and welcome back, everybody, and a special welcome to the Tech Field Day delegates. I see a lot of familiar faces, and it's great to see you all. Uh, so everybody that joined us in the beginning knows that we introduced today our new product, Scality Artesca. Uh, it has a short and sweet descriptive sentence, lightweight cloud native object storage. And just a quick recap, the lightweight really focuses on ease of use, the ability to start small and grow very seamlessly uh, multiple, uh, one server at a time. The cloud native aspect, the entire system is built as containerized services deployed and orchestrated on Kubernetes. And again, this is really focused on applications to make sure that new workloads in AI and ML, big data analytics, and on the edge can really have storage that they can consume with data management policies that let them mobilize data back to a central core or to a cloud. We really think that the innovation here is to, to combine lightweight and enterprise grade capabilities. So we have no shortcomings on data durability, management, fitting into your management ecosystem, and ultimately making sure that the, that data is accessible quickly with very high performance. Now, all of this is really predicated around this wave that's happening around us, this cloud native wave. We're seeing a lot of new applications. We're seeing a lot of Kubernetes environments, and we're really seeing kind of what we think is an inflection point in the market. For us, one of the things is a new user. We really wanna make this very, very easy to use by application teams and people that work for those application teams, including DevOps staff. And I think it's very useful to hear from an outside perspective. So we have a couple of experts that'll talk to you a little bit about what they're seeing in the industry from a cloud native perspective, and maybe weave in some comments around new workloads and the edge. So with that, let me hand it off and uh, we'll hear from our expert panel. Thanks very much, Paul, for that uh, quick recap. So uh, next, we've got a couple of special guests here. Neither of these folks works for HPE or Scality. They're independent folks in the data and cloud space and people that I know personally and respect very much. So today we're gonna discuss a little bit uh, the DevOps implications of the Scality and HPE Artesca product. So before I begin, let's have a quick introduction. Uh, James, do you wanna say a moment uh, about yourself? Yep, James Governor, uh, co-founder of a company called Redmonk. Uh, we're a research company, and we spend our time trying to understand uh, tech adoption through the lens of the practitioner. So we really focus on engineers, uh, software developers, and those engineering teams that are, uh, frankly, have uh, ever-increasing influence. Um, so our, our way of understanding the world is through adoption more than purchasing, um, but we're all about the practitioner. Well, thank you very much, James. And of course, Joey. 
Uh, I'm Joey D'Antoni. I'm a principal consultant at Denny Train Associates Consulting. Uh, we specialize in doing all things cloud and data, and I work with a lot of customers and write a lot of things and speak a lot about cloud, clouds and data. So we've seen uh, certainly a lot of interest uh, for, uh, in Kubernetes and cloud native applications, uh, starting, of course, with the hyperscalers, but certainly now in the enterprise space. What is it about uh, cloud native architectures and sort of DevOps mindset that makes this the future? I'll go ahead. And, go ahead. Go ahead go, okay. Uh, I feel like the portability of the platform, and I think the fact that the hyperscalers are really driving it, so you're seeing a lot of innovation there that they're using because they can make their products more flexible uh, on a platform that's kind of the same anywhere, You know, whether it be the developer's workstation or in the cloud or even on physical hardware. Uh, I think that's the real benefit to the solution is that you get the same thing everywhere and it does integrate nicely into modern DevOps workflows. There you go, Joey did said what I was going to say. I think that's exactly right. Uh, portability uh, is a huge issue um, for uh, enterprises. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes uh, they are willing to make that trade off uh, in terms of, of something that looks a little bit proprietary. Um, but, but overall, portability remains super important. And I think the, the DevOps workflows, and particularly in development, one of the things with containers was it kind of hit that, that notion of doing a lot more testing, um, spinning, up an, uh, spinning up an instance of something, throwing it away. And so the idea that, that, that we were going through, we didn't want to be doing patching. You just uh, you know, get the environment that you're going to target, uh, develop your app, test it, maybe blow it away, roll that into production, it really mapped to a lot of the, the new workflows that developers were using. So developers and DevOps workflows made containers popular. Docker really changed the game there um, from a, a developer experience perspective. But obviously Kubernetes has come along in terms of the operator experience and the deployment experience. And yeah, it is, um, it's a phenomenon, frankly. The, the rate at which uh, developers have, uh, uh, enterprises have been adopting that has been uh, really pretty interesting. It's a phenomenon, like I say. Hey guys, um, originally containers were more or less stateless types of uh, solutions. And we're here, here we are talking about storage and that sort of stuff. Where do you see storage or persistent storage in a, in a container application environment? I'll, I'll, I'll start with that, James. I, this is a, that's a great question, right? Uh, I think, what, as you mentioned, both Kubernetes and Docker weren't necessarily contain, uh, built with storage and storage in mind, you know, things like uh, web web servers and, and things like that that are stateless uh, and don't store data. But I think in recent years, there's been a, a heavy trend to run database workloads and, and NoSQL data workloads uh, on these sorts of volumes. Just, I mean, I know from my perspective in a Microsoft One SQL server uh, on both Kubernetes and, and Docker, and for some of our customers that build tools against that platform, uh, it enables them to quickly do regression testing against various versions and, and update levels and things like that. Uh, I think the challenge in that is that storage has definitely was an afterthought when these systems were designed. Uh, and there are still some challenges in this space. It's improving. Uh, there's a couple of cloud standards. I believe one's the cloud object storage standard that was referred to in the earlier session uh, that are making making the, the folks building things for Kubernetes uh, have common storage standards, but it's definitely still kind of a, probably the biggest concern amongst my customers who want to implement. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the idea of stateless apps uh, sounds great, um, but, you know, we're always going to hit uh, a need for persistence when we're building uh, applications with any, any kind of transactionality. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that the, uh, uh, the, the, the stateless um, idea in 12-factor applications uh, is a good one. Um, but to Joey's point, uh, what we've seen is, is, is organizations, one of the reasons they're using Kubernetes is feeling that they can actually um, take advantage of some of the models that they were previously using, take them to the cloud. Uh, but now they're asking questions about, you know, uh, the architecture. Uh, is there something packaged for me uh, in a way that this can be more effective? I mean, I think Kubernetes and the, the cloud native stack, it, it, it's had a, had a significant effect sort of up and down the stack, you know, certainly looking at networking. Um, and networking models. And I think that storage is, is one of the areas that we're gonna see get filled out um, and defined um, over the next couple of years. Yeah, thanks. Other question. So what do you think about you know, serverless in the enterprise? I mean, 
uh, we talked today about an object store that can be deployed practically everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, serverless in, in the form of Lambda, for example, for S3 uh, is quite an important thing. So how do you see this kind of technology implemented at the edge or, you know, in, in other parts of the, the IT stack? So yeah, I mean, I, th I think that uh, Lambda it has been interesting because it was launched, it took a while to kind of uh, hit the knee in the curve, but we've seen enthusiastic embrace by enterprises. Um, you know, and it, it's kind of interesting because at first it seemed it was going to be, you know, sort of hipster developers, um, but but in a way, Lambda, Lambda has been for the laggards and it is a, an enterprise that has been adopted by uh, enterprises. It's a, it's a technology where they felt like, look, we can outsource uh, some of the manageability uh, to the platform. Um, in terms of the, the edge, I mean, it's interesting one, I've been uh, what, what they call, uh, or what I would say was edge skeptic, um, but I'm beginning to see uh, some changes there where we're pretty clearly uh, seeing a reality to edge computing. There are a couple of different models there. One is uh, we've seen the serverless model um, instantiated by um, some of those edge platforms. So if we look at Cloudflare and Fastly, um, they're building out um, a, a model for that. We're beginning to see some enterprise adoption there. In terms of the Kubernetes world, um, there, there are uh, some frameworks there to move to a more serverless model. Um, and uh, Knative uh, is, is, is an example of, of a technology that people are building serverless um, um, types of uh, applications uh, on, on top of that. Um, I think the, the model is, is certainly attractive because you know, we've got um, a lack of skills. We can't have everybody focusing on every uh, operational detail of scaling applications. And that's one of the areas where serverless has paid dividends. And, and so for companies, organizations that wanna build distributed apps um, that are functions-based um, where the scale is managed for them, uh, serverless is, is, is an attractive uh, proposition. I do think you still need to think about uh, data persistence, though, uh, even in a serverless application. And that may be uh, you're simply persisting that data right down to the object store, uh, particularly in edge edge scenarios that are so data driven, right? Because like a lot of times this is sensor data or log data that's coming in from various devices uh, in the field. And how, how you persist that data is going to be a challenge. And, is that going to be something you write directly to the object store from uh, from a Lambda function? Or, or are you going to flush through a, a, some kind of data store, whether it be a data lake or a database or whatever? Uh, so thinking about those concepts and how you manage that data is kind of elemental, I think, in any of these discussions. I would agree. And I, I think to Enrico's point, if we look at sort of the way S3 is used, there are some, some just interesting new use cases. Um, that's one of the, the advantages of Snowflake. Obviously, Snowflake uh, has done a great job of, of taking data warehousing into the cloud. And for them, it's like, look, store all of your data in S3. You're not paying for the storage, but then you pay for the compute. And I think those sorts of changes, you know, one of the interesting ideas about serverless is that you're only paying when you're actually using the application. It is that, that usage-based model. And, and that's the kind of thing that, I, that, that what we tend to see is what happens at hyperscale, what happens in, in, in the cloud companies, uh, we, we, we are seeing replicated in, in hybrid sorts of formats. So there are definitely some interesting new um, uh, application opportunities out there. Yeah, and that, that really aligns kind of with uh, the data usage patterns, if you think about them at the cloud, because or excuse me, at the edge, not the cloud, uh, or the edge of the cloud. Uh, typically, you have some hot stream uh, that's a, a streaming query engine like Kafka, where you're looking for out-of-band values, uh, whereas then you're persisting all of the values to, to that object store. Uh, so being able to separate that uh, storage from compute is actually, I had a discussion with a customer about this and they, they're kind of in a legacy data warehouse, but uh, they have so much data and code, it's really challenging to get out of it. But as I mentioned to them, separating data from compute is really the holy grail because then you can get that costing much more effective. Hey guys, um, real quick. So so from an Arteska perspective, um, are you is this a Kubernetes only deployment or can I take something like HashiCorp Nomad things like that, are you guys seeing adoption in that area or is, is it not even applicable? I think hold on that to that question until the end. Uh, okay. we're, we're trying to avoid product specific stuff. In, in this okay, no, that's good. Um, but, but what I would say is, is that, you know, if, if we look at these, these edge deployments, 
uh, and certainly in the Kubernetes world, uh, one of the questions has been around skills. So there are some really interesting examples. Target um, is a retailer saying, we're going to have Kubernetes in store. Now think about it, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that Target isn't planning to have an SRE uh, in, 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 every, uh, in, in every retail store. Chick-fil-A um, is, is having uh, Kubernetes uh, deployed in, in, you know, literally, you know, when you go and, 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 and buy your chicken sandwich, um, again, there is uh, Kubernetes uh, in, in the branch. I think in terms of um, um, the, the question about HashCorp, that's an interesting one because there is another use case um, or a couple of, uh, of other interesting use cases, but 5G in particular, uh, unlike 4G, 5G has much more requirement for directed um, uh, networking. And so from that perspective, there's much more requirement for compute and uh, Kubernetes is, is beginning to look like the natural, um, the natural environment for that. So again, here I am having said I was an edge skeptic and I'm putting forward all these use cases, but the, the key there is we're gonna have to have models for managed and or packaged solutions that allow organizations to do these deployments without you know, spending all of their money on SREs and engineers. They, they are gonna have to invest in product um, in order that they can do some of this stuff. And that's kind of where having that fully API driven architecture is so important, right? Because if, if you can, if you can hit everything programmatically, you can hit everything via code, it becomes much more easily to central, centrally manage uh, all of those, those solutions that you have on the edge. I mean, beyond just keeping up with your hardware and your retail locations, it can be a little bit of a challenge in and of itself, but uh, you can at least monitor it from one platform. I have a question about, you know, what kind of edge we usually target? I mean, so we we talk about edge for everything that is not core or it's not cloud, but actually there are several types of edge, including you know mobile phones, and cell towers, whatever. And for some of them, we are talking about you know very small environments. So even if the data collection is uh, massive, we are talking about, you know, problems with efficiency, with everything. So what's the role, I mean, of all this technology compared to you know, what you can really do? I mean, uh, for example, today we are talking about an object store. Usually we think about object store as, you know, uh, uh, big uh, clusters with a lot of capacity and everything, but actually can we deploy this kind of technology and make, make it sustainable, including Kubernetes, including everything? I know there are initiatives, but actually, how small can we get with this technology to make it, you know, still usable and but, reliable and everything? So just to, to pimp something that I recently did, I, I wrote a guerrilla guide on edge for, for Scality as part of this launch. And I don't know if it's available yet, but it should be. But you're right, Enrico, that there are several types of edge computing. Uh, and it's really going to depend on the nature, the size of the, the compute you're going to have is going to depend on the nature of the location. Like James mentioned, a target store can probably have a rack of servers or two. Uh, if you're on a submarine and you're collecting data, you, you're going to have less space and you might get, you know, a couple of appliances that you can get in there. And I, I believe Scality's solution uh, scales pretty small. Uh, so they can run on small amounts of data uh, and then quickly tear that back up into the cloud uh, or they can, you know, retain a lot more and maybe do some processing of the data before sending it to the cloud. Uh, so it's always going to be kind of a trade off, uh, generally speaking, with physical and, and data center limitations uh, from what I've seen in, in some of the deployments I've looked at. Joey, just to, to your point about the Grilly Guides being available, they are available for download to the audience watching via an expo in the handouts pane. So they're both of the Grilly Guides that were written are actually available for download. Cool. So as two folks who are specializing in the uh, sort of next generation of uh, applications here, uh, what is it about this space that you think is making enterprise companies like Scality and HPE start to take notice? And, and what is it about this space that's really having, you know, edge uh, be uh, getting real? Well, I mean, look, the reason the vendors are interested, I think that's really simple. Um, you know, maybe an apocryphal story, but, uh, you know, famous, famous question um, to, to uh, Willie Sutton, which was like, why do you rob banks? And because that's where the money is. And, you know, Kubernetes is a fundamental buying context uh, in the enterprise today. Um, 
as I say, it's, it's touching multiple levels um, uh, of the stack. It is, it's touching storage, compute, networking. Uh, it is changing how all of these things are done. Um, and, and, you know, from an enterprise perspective, look, they, they do want to be able to move uh, more quickly. Uh, cloud native is a thing. They are, you know, a high level, the C level is digital transformation. Underneath that, the architect's level is, is kind of uh, cloud native. Um, and there are a lot of changes that are required to take advantage of the, the workflows that, that Joey's mentioned um, in, in and around uh, DevOps. I think very much I talk about pipelines, you know, thinking about that kind of testing where you're doing DevSecOps, you're going to put load testing in there, you're going to be moving uh, testing left, you're also going to be moving, um, you know, production and, and testing right. I mean, you know, frankly, organizations are now doing, um, uh, you know, testing in production. You think about, well, could I begin to do things like canarying, where I could take uh, maybe, you know, a, a small percentage of my uh, traffic and point a, a, a named cohort of users at that um, uh, in order to understand how they, their experience is before I roll it out more broadly, or blue-green deployments. The sort of architectures that we've got here that enable progressive delivery are increasingly interesting, I think, to enterprise organizations. And, and so it's that, it's just thinking about, we need to modernize, we need a platform for doing that. Um, we do need uh, to be working with, with people to package that up for us. I think very few people want to do it vanilla. So that's why they need the support of vendors in order to, um, uh, you know, frankly, take ad ad advantage of architectures and platforms that are hardened for them. Yeah, I, I also think this was a problem in, in the Hadoop time frame too. When, Absolutely. When Hadoop came in, right? When Hadoop first started, and I mean, after it started, but when it, when it first went mainstream, uh, when it went from, you know, the garage to the nightclubs and then to the small arenas, uh, it was really challenging to build out a Hadoop cluster. And it, getting the storage configuration right, getting your server configuration right was all really challenging. And like, I feel like that definitely held back the adoption of Hadoop on a broader scale. And it's funny because a lot of those same fundamental technologies are what make up modern object stores. But having uh, kind of a pre-built good storage solution that you can plug Kubernetes into uh, makes everyone's life a lot easier, especially at an enterprise where you might not necessarily have the, the deep dive skill levels on, on bleeding edge technology that you'd have at a software or hardware firm. Uh, so I think having those solutions in place allows for easier adoption and smoother adoption for, for organizations. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, I think we could probably listen to you all day, but uh, we are going to move along here next uh, with a demo. I know that lots of folks are interested in what Artesca is and how it works. And uh, that's uh, the next thing we're going to do is uh, just do a quick uh, fly through of the user interface. Uh, Paul, uh, take it away. Thank you again. And thanks to the uh, panel. I really appreciate the comments. Uh, so yeah, this is the part that I've been looking forward to for quite a while here, which is to give you a deeper look at our user interface. Uh, we have a task on our hand here, which is to really demonstrate to you what we've been saying, right? One of the key tenets of our system is operational simplicity. We'll focus on that. We've also said enterprise grade capabilities. We wanna bring those out as part of this fly through. And then we mentioned multi-cloud namespace and the ability to manage data between edge and core. So we want to bring all those things out to you. Uh, what's really exciting is I get to partner with my colleague and friend, Candida. Uh, she is now going to take control and run the demo from her, her machine. Uh, so Candida is our field CTO. Uh, if the team could flip over to her machine, our goal together is to going to be to show you the key elements of the user interface. Uh, so with that, how are you doing, Candida? I'm doing great, uh, Paul. Just get me right here. Let's do this, and here it is. Uh, so I'm doing great, Paul. I'm, uh, Paul. I'm super excited to be with you to show the power of our Tesca. That's awesome. I know you're going to bring us the energy, so this is wonderful. Uh, now, you and I have been on the inside, right? So we both know that this system and the UI is really designed to provide an easy experience for the user, right? And that means making it end-to-end -end simple is really the, been the key goal. Now, it looks like you already have the UI dashboard displayed right now. Can you do a quick remind of what the key highlights of this page are and just really focus on operational simplicity? Uh, yes, sure. So you're 100% right. That overall goal is operational simplicity. 
what you will notice throughout this quick tour is that we don't assume the user is a storage administrator. And there's also no need to have Linux administrator experience. We have elevated the UI above those types of complex issues. Okay, that's really great because what it means is that you can be an expert, but you can also be a non-expert and operate the system. Absolutely. This makes the system accessible and usable to people with a wide range of skills. Uh, let me show you. Notice that I have in here several layers of the dashboard UI page. Right here on the top, what we provide you is an easy at a glance like view of your data health. Right next to it, you will see the health of your data management task. And right below, you will see the next layer that shows your S3 data services. You can define one or more, or more of those ones. Since our Tesca is a multi-tenant storage solution, you can have an S3 endpoint data service for your applications, for your use cases, or even for your user groups. That will keep them logically separated and will also help with network security. Okay, I get it. So I could have a dedicated data service for multiple apps, like maybe a backup app, an analytics app, and so on. Uh, but here, the one you've defined says AIML, so it looks like it's some kind of machine learning application. Is that right? That's right. This demo, our Tesca deployment, is for an Edge application use case. Paul, let's do some VR right now, and let's imagine we are in a factory location where they have cameras and sensors capturing and creating data on the factory floor of the parts being manufactured. Applications in that factory can use their Tesca system to store image data on the manufacturing line and the machine learning application may be analyzing those images to enrich them with metadata tags. The data service will support storing both the image data and the extended metadata attributes from those applications. Okay, I'm, I'm very happy you mentioned metadata, right? It's extremely relevant. We hear it all the time about object storage. Uh, but we certainly hear about the rise of new application workloads, AI and machine learning, and metadata for enriching that kind of uh, data is really valuable. Now, can you talk about the next layer down, the one that says storage services? Yeah, this is where things get way more interesting because we get into their test cast multi-cloud capabilities. Note that I have right here in a storage service defined for my Artesca instance in the factory location. You see there Artesca 1. It's a single server deployment with around 70 terabytes capacity. Right next to it, I also have a multi-petabyte deployment of the escalator ring within the same namespace. That escalator ring is deployed remotely in a central data center. And right next to that one, you see two cloud storage services, one for AWS S3 and the other one for Microsoft Azure Blob. So you have four different storage services within one single namespace. Okay, I get it. So it's basically, I can see all of my data in one UI console. I think all of us here have heard about the famous one pane of glass, right? But this really seems to deliver it. And as I understand it, and as I know, this also provides data management capabilities across all of these backends. Is that right? A hundred percent. In fact, that's what I have in here in the top level, lifecycle uh, hell view refers to. It shows the status of the application and lifecycle management workflow. And those workflows can operate between any of the storage locations and cloud services you have defined. Okay, so to tie it back into some of the comments I made earlier and what you set up, you could have an edge site in the factory, you could have camera image data, and then you could replicate that back to a central data center or to a cloud. That has a lot of applications for the edge, right? I, I totally agree. Now, what about the next one down, the platform layer? Can you show us a little bit about what you can get in terms of information regarding the underlying platform? Of course. Let's click in here and let's see. Now, the first thing we see is that since our Tesca is a cloud native architecture, this view starts at the Kubernetes layer. This allows me to see the Kubernetes platform level services, health and performance indicators. Once I have viewed the platform at the Kubernetes layer, I can click on the tabs right here on the left side of the page to get more details about the nodes and the storage volumes. Uh, you remember, Paul, this Artesca in the factory has one server, so here 
it shows me that one single uh, node. I can click in here and now I can browse and see the overall status of the node. I can get health and performance uh, and utilization information. I can get things like CPU, memory utilization and performance metric are all displayed in here. If you notice also, I have here a volume tab. I can click in here and I can see more info about that volume layer, where it will show me the listing of all the, the volumes in that specific node, the relevant health, utilization, and performance indicators about them. Okay, I get it. So we wanna talk, that's a great view, thank you very much. Uh, but I wanna talk more about enterprise grade capabilities. And I think this kind of monitoring of the platform is a part of that. But users also expect storage systems to detect and alert the administrator about things like faults, right? Like a failure at the platform layer. Can you show us quickly what happens if a disk fails in this UI? Definitely, and while you were talking about that, my disk fail. So here it shows a failure of a disk. Uh, the user is already, as you can see, alerted visually here in the UIs. For example, this is highlighted uh, an alert that will show if a volume fails in the node. The data held view of the dashboard will also show you a change in data protection status when a disk fails. But you don't have to worry about it because Arteska will rebuild the data on the failed disk through a self-healing process. So once that has completed, your data protection will return to its original fully protected state. Okay, so Arteska can deal with the types of platform and component failures. It can alert the user and it can also resolve the issues through self-healing, that's really great. Uh, there's one other part of enterprise grade I want to talk about, and that is storage utilization and analytics. Uh, this is a hot topic. You know, it's certainly needed for capacity planning. Give us a little bit of a view into what the UI can do in terms of analytics. Yes, Arteska has a comprehensive analytics capability. I can change right now. We'll change the page now to the account view and show you the type of metrics that the system uh, tracks and how it visualizes that information. So I click in here, and if you notice that I have in here focus on my storage account called factory camera. So this is the account where I'm capturing the image data from the factory floor. As I click this account, this factory camera account, I get a comprehensive view of the storage and performance utilization metrics. For example, how much capacity is being consumed by the buckets and the objects in this account how many objects I have stored, and even metrics about things like throughput and the numbers of operations the application has done against this specific account. The graph here also showed, you know, trending metrics which helps with capacity planning, as you had mentioned before, that is super important. And we all know, you know, DevOps, we talked about the DevOps folks, can use this to get a projection on how fast their storage is filling up and to identify when the system will need to be a scale out in order to add more capacity. Okay, I get it, right? So it's a lot of comprehensive information. It's presented very clearly. And as we said before, Arteska can start small like you have here on a single server, but of course it can easily grow or scale out one server at a time. That is right. The operational simplicity means both the tasks that you perform weekly or daily, daily, but also the tasks that, you know, they come every few months or quarter, like growing the system with additional capacity. They're all very, very easy to do. Okay, thanks very much for that. Now, I want to transition because before we finish, I do want to show our audience one more thing, and that is there's an integrated data browser in the Arteska UI. Can you show us that? Yes, do that. Let me show you in here. As you can see, if I click right here in the data browser, what you will see is that the page is a data browser. It's fully integrated in the UI. So you don't have to switch to a different browser or tool. Uh, this browser lets me see all buckets that you can see in here uh, that I have in my account. And I can even click on any of them and browse the data objects in it. For example, let me see, let me see, camera one bucket. So let's see what I have right here for camera one bucket. So now you have a bunch of images that I already store under that specific account. Those are the images from the cameras on the factory floor. And now if I click on any of them, 
in the UI. The UI also will get me a way to download the object if I want to view it. Let's see. Here it is. Let's check this one. Here it is. Very cool. Okay, I, I see. So you can create buckets, you can upload and download objects, you can view the objects. Super integrated. I remember the days where you had to jump out to a separate tool to do that. Now, you and I talked a little bit about metadata, right, on objects. Can you quickly show us what's available in the UI for metadata? Yeah, by clicking on an object, I can view metadata attributes and tags. Both are supported through the S3 API and can also edit or add new attributes here to the UI. It's super easy. Notice that we have some attributes that describe the machine from the machine learning application. Okay, I understand. So you can edit metadata, you can add new tags and, and key value attributes. Uh, how about search? Can you show us what the search uh, looks like? Yeah, I'm showing it right now. I just did a search for a color named blue. I can see all the, the results. Now let's do a search for a file that is, you know, for meta, for PDF. So now I see all my PDF listing. Uh, it makes locating the right data very easy. And know that this can also be accessed access programmatically through the API. So search is available both in the UI and for applications. Okay, so this really follows our theme, right? That everything available through the UI is also available through a API. That can mean applications, it can mean tools and consoles and scripts. A very powerful Candida, I really appreciate this. Thank you very much for the tour. Uh, with that, uh, we can, Stephen, we can jump back to the slide deck. Candida, you really brought it. Thank you again. Thank you, guys. Thank you both. Yes, absolutely. I really enjoyed the uh, the quick demo there, uh, walkthrough of the whole presentation, the whole capabilities of the product. Thank you so much, Candida. So uh, next, we're going to transition into the Tech Field Day Delegate Roundtable. But before we do that, uh, Paul, I'll just give you a moment. Uh, do you have uh, any last words about the demo and the user interface? Yeah, we wanted to provide this kind of quick view and really focus on a few key capabilities. There's much more behind the scenes. Obviously, we focused on these three bullets. Multi-cloud, we think, is a major thing, right? Data management is really what people look for in this day and age in terms of the value in you know, unlocking the value of their data and things like that. Over time, you'll see us add more and more capabilities. You know, we really see this as a fit. Uh, one other thing I didn't say is that we also support a Prometheus API. Uh, Prometheus is kind of emerging as well in this Kubernetes space, and we see uh, the UI, the API, and Prometheus as being really valuable for remote monitoring of applications. So that's another part of our management uh, and monitoring capabilities. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, next, uh, it's time for a Tech Field Day tradition going all the way back to when we started this event 11 years ago. And that is the, uh, the Field Day Roundtable discussion. Essentially, uh, we're opening up the floor. So we're gonna be joined now by basically everyone you've heard from here, including Jerome and Paul and Candida from Scality, uh, Chris and Carol from HPE, uh, James and Joey are independent uh, folks who uh, you heard at, during that uh, uh, panel discussion, as well as the Tech Field Day delegates themselves. So all of these are independent technical influencers with blogs and podcasts, and they record videos, and they're uh, tweeting right now, actually. If you go to techfieldday.com, you can learn more about who these folks are. But I'm going to turn it over to them now to ask some questions and get some points clarified. So. Uh, Tech Field Day delegates, uh, which of you wants to start off? Maybe Larry, this is a good time to ask your question. Sure, sorry about that guys. Um, yeah, so the, the thing that I was qu uh, questioning about is um, Artesca from, from a deployment perspective. Um, I know obviously Kubernetes is the, the, the thing, right? Um, but for customers that are doing things like HashiCorp Nomad and some other things, um, are we seeing or has there been any momentum with uh, something like Artesca that's being deployed outside of Kubernetes and these other container management platforms? Yeah, I, I'll take that. I think we've been really focused on Kubernetes here at the okay. start. I've heard lots of discussions around you know, other frameworks for deployment, including HashiCorp. It's, it's yeah. very popular. You know, we're going to keep our eyes open. I, I think right now it's supporting the immediate set of Kubernetes distributions. That's really key for us, but we're great listeners, right? And we deliver the software in an agile manner. So uh, I'll keep an eye out or an ear out for HashiCorp. And I, I think it's certainly possible that we'll find a way to integrate with that. 
Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Like I say, you know, it's just more of a question of, you know, it makes sense to start with the hot, hot thing. And it's not anything new. We all know that, but that makes perfect sense. And thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So one of the questions I had, you know, we we're talking earlier about the uh, portability of uh, Kubernetes as being extremely important to its adapt, uh, adaptability and adopt, uh, adoption rate. So the, the replica capabilities within Arteska, how is that? I mean, it, it, is it, is it kind of outside the, the pure object storage perspective, but it's got some sort of workflow cap characteristic or, or how does this all fit together? Yeah, so I think that was Ray. Uh, hi, Ray. I, you may be referring to uh, data replication at the Arteska layer. Indeed, that is above. That's a data service that we provide. So it's one of the set of containerized services running in our architecture. You know, there's a set of background processing queues that know how to, how to do asynchronous processing of events. One of those asynchronous events is replication. So as you add an object to a bucket, what do we do? We queue up an object uh, somewhere in a queue, in a background queue. A background process takes over and takes care of replicating that to its target. Uh, that's out of band from the application, so the application gets control back. Uh, but we are managing that in our services layer, really within the architecture, above above Kubernetes, but within our architecture. And the services layer is some service running in the cloud? Is that how no, it? No, all of it's running locally in Arteska. So all of our services are deployed and managed on the Kubernetes. And again, think of it as a stack, right? But the stack is now containerized, microservices and services, but it starts with data services, multi-cloud, and then all the way down to storage. That's, that's really, you know, kind of the cloud native model that we're talking about here. Okay, thanks. I'm going to um, bring a question forward from the NXPO audience that's still watching. And the question is a basic one, but it's an important one. Um, when is this available from HPE? That's probably Carol, I would imagine, right? May 4th. May 4th. May, may the 4th be with you. Awesome. Thank you remember. Thank you. <laughs> so, James, I, I have a question based on your experience with, with developers and practitioners. So you spend a lot of time with them. Um, with Arteska, it feels like this is aimed more at the enterprise IT central buying function rather than the devs themselves. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that frankly, both roles are, are necessary. I think one thing that happened with Kubernetes early on was that it was, it was you know, you had to be able to do everything. So, um, you know, you had, oh, well, you, you practically had to be, you know, writing it in order to use it. And I think we're now beginning to see a little bit more specialization. I mean, you don't want all of your developers having to mess around necessarily with YAML and Helm charts and everything else. Perhaps they should just be focusing on the business applications that they're writing. Um, so I think that there is room for, and we're beginning to see a bit of a separation of concerns. There's an understanding that the, the Kubernetes developer experience has not been that great. Um, so we're seeing investments there, but by the same token, um, how do we take the skills we have and make them relevant in these new uh, cloud native um, infrastructures. So uh, certainly if, uh, uh, from a, a software perspective, um, the, the, there is an argument for uh, operator centric tooling because there are gonna be operators that are managing some of this stuff. Um, that said, uh, hey, I mean, it's, it's dark mode. So that's a good start if you want to appeal to developers. So yeah, I, I think that, 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 that there is some um, uh, there is some room for specialization, um, and and there always there's always going to be room, I believe, for for admins. You can do all the auto automation you want, um, but but you you need to be able to make people productive that that are not um, you know going to uh, every KubeCon and are not absolutely deep in the weeds. So I think there's, 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 there's a bit of both. And one of the, the big trends over the next couple of years will be a more specialized uh, develop, development environments running on Kubernetes, but also operators being able to do a, a, a wider, wider set of things. Um, and, and, you know, uh, the, 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 the jobs change, um, but, but that's not to say that the people we've got can't learn these new platforms and be uh, valuable in these sorts of contexts. Uh, this is Jerome here. I'd like to add something to, to this uh, response. Um, I think this is a great question and a difficult one. Uh, we wanted to bring a product that uh, is easy to use for the developers in whatever they are building 
and that also meet the parameters for enterprise grade. And it's been a lot of the work that we've done over the past few years to understand how can we both be truly enterprise grade, but be easily usable by the developers. So it, it's our goal. I think that uh, the future will tell if we completely hit the mark, but we're going to continue listening to both community because at the end of the day, whatever is being um, developed by the developer community has to be run and it has to be run at scale. And again, when I say scale, it's infinitely big and infinitely small. Um, so that's definitely what we're trying to do to appeal to both audience. I have a question about the code. So, um, you know, in the last few years, you released a lot of open source uh, solutions, Zinco and, you know, the S3 server uh, and so on. And now this is a closed source solution. So, and looks like a departure from the, you know, your strategy from the, from the past. So what can you add on, on this? Look, f fundamentally, we want to open source as much as possible. We absolutely believe in open source. We believe in the role of open source for infrastructure. And candidly, Enrico, we also want to make money. Uh, and I have personally seen so much open source being abused. Uh, I, a few years ago, I actually personally went to many of our customers and said, well, okay, so if we open sourced everything, uh, would you pay us the same amount annually? And many of our large customers said no we actually don't pay that kind of amount for open source. And so this was a setback for me because, you know, um, the, the, the market of providing free software is not exactly how I'm going to sustain the R&D that we're doing and being able to bring to the world this kind of product. So it, it's a balance. Um, let me, um, you know, notice that uh, all our metal kate uh, layer, all the Kubernetes layer that we're providing is open source, has been open sourced. Uh, a couple of years ago and is actually uh, pretty active in the open source community. So we will continue bringing open source technology to the world uh, while preserving the ability for scality to make money and continue financing its R&D. So, so real quick, can I, not to be the devil's advocate here, but let me throw this in and just uh, purely out of conversation, see where this goes. So one of the things that, that I caught on to, back to Justin's point, like the enterprise, it feels very enterprise driven. None, not a problem. Um, the, the comments that were just made feel very enterprise focused as well. Again, not a problem. The struggle I have, maybe just myself, is it feels like almost you need to pick a lane on where you want to go with this product, either enterprise, which is cool, or DevOpsy writing. You, you know where I'm going with this, the whole DevOps open source movement that's been going on forever. I don't know. That's just where my head goes when I hear this because I really struggle with, do I look at this because I look at it from an enterprise perspective? Yeah, the GUI looks great. But if I'm more focused on the other side, I really don't care about a GUI. I could care less if I was a GUI. Um, i just curious where this conversation went. And we don't even have to talk about it now. It's just where, you know, the reality is how many enterprises, big enterprises, HP's behind this initially, um, you know, how many big enterprises are going this route? You know, I don't know. Anybody want to so, chime in or is that so, just like a really let, stupid let me, question? Let, I mean, look, this is a debate that we're not going to close today. But uh, first of all, many of our enterprise customers are fully embracing uh, the DevOps world. Uh, and yes, part of this is the open source. But, you know, they're, they're, most of our customers, they really don't care about whether the software is open source or not. They care about whether it's uh, agile for development for their um, developers. I mean, I'm talking customers who have uh, thousands of developers in house and whether it supports all of their security and reliability and um, speed a need, okay? That, that's really what they care about. They, they're actually not asking us, are you open source? Are you not open source? That's, that, that's not a question that's being asked to us. Um, but, but I would agree that uh, this is a debate that's going to, uh, uh, to follow through um, for, the, for the months to come. No, no, that's good. Like I say, it was just more of, you know, what, what, you know, how do we talk to our customers and, and things like that when we start talking about the solution of, you know, again, right. we can take there, that there's off. There's another thing, Larry. I mean, today we, we showed the UI because the UI is easy to show. It's sexy. It looks good. We have, again, the, the UI is entirely built on top of API and they're all documented. Uh, except I don't know how to show this 
in a presentation like today. So I could show you a, a huge UI, uh, API documentation, but it wouldn't be very sexy. No, it's all good. It's all good. Thank you. Hey there, I've got questions. Barry here. Really enjoyed the presentation and the discussion uh, by James and Joey as well around the kind of use cases and what's going on. Lots of discussion around uh, kind of uh, vertically aligned solutions, the factory and, and things like that. Are you working with any ISVs or with HPE with vertically aligned solutions or anything like that where this may be prepackaged as part of a bigger solution or anything like that? Uh, this is Paul. Let me take that. So we have always viewed partners as part of the solution, right? Uh, we, storage by itself rarely is the incomplete stack for the customer. Uh, we've had 100 plus partners for Scality Ring on the ISV side, and we definitely see that as a focus here. We're already working with backup vendors and analytics vendors and, uh, you know, people that are packaging applications in the AI and ML space. We absolutely see it as part of what we need to do is to make sure that we work with them and that we're validated. In terms of bundling, there's some early discussions around that, but I think it would make sense in various spaces, including in analytics and backup. I think um, for me, that's where the UI may come in. I mean, I've got customers that may be in the retail space that if they do need those kind of solutions would be important. The ISV would clearly want the API side of it to automate whatever their software is doing with it. But I just know the guys that uh, I would be dealing with wouldn't have a clue what to be doing with APIs and things like that. They want to go, wait a minute, there's a problem in that store. Can I jump on it and see what's going on in that store? So I, I really like the, the demonstration of the dashboard and the API. Thank you. This is Mark here. I've got a two part question. The first is light implies fewer lines of code, Paul. So if it's fewer lines of code, does that translate into lower latency? And before you answer that question, how much lower latency? And the second part is strategic. On the licensing, it's cloud native. This is where you're going after with the Artesca storage at this point. So if it's cloud native, are, are there any plans to do a Pay as you use type of licensing, or is it just a, a pure subscription model? All right, let me take the first part of that, Mark. So you asked about performance and lightweight. And so the first part of the answer is yes, there is a lot fewer lines of code here. One of the things we made a really strategic decision not to do is to put a POSIX file system in this product. Uh, Ring has that, it addresses those use cases and it was necessary to do that for the time and the place it was in. Uh, we are much lighter weight in terms of resource utilization. In terms of performance and latency, we're absolutely aiming for a different latency response point than we have in the past. Ring was actually always decent. It could actually achieve into the single digit millisecond response times. We wanna go way beyond that and to really leverage flash in a more primary way. Uh, I don't have numbers immediately to share. One of the great things about HPE is they brought us a really expensive lab to do all this kind of performance testing in. We'll do it both in the lab and real world and share some results as soon as we have them. But yes, aiming higher. Uh, the hey, add, I'm sorry, Paul. I was gonna add on to your, your remark there. Um, so we can also sell this to you as a Greenlight contract and it's metered, um, metered usage under, under Greenlight so you can have a pay as you go um, model that way. Paul, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, that's perfect. In fact, I was uh, going to look for some help on the subscription and the pay-as-you-go, so thank you. Thank you. We do have time for one more question, if any of the delegates have one more, but uh, we actually are a little over the hour, so anybody got one last thing? Yeah, it's actually, Stephen, it's, uh, it's Paul here. Um, just a quick question. I, I, I may have missed this in the main presentation. I wasn't sure, but you, you talked about uh, kind of Ring as your uh, traditional object store, for, for want of a better phrase. Uh, have we got integration here? Uh, and if not, is it planned? Yeah, so the integration of Artesca to Ring is that Artesca can view Ring in its uh, namespace and its storage services, and it can actually mobilize data between Artesca instances and Ring. So I could replicate, lifecycle, uh, all of these policies that we add on top, Ring can certainly be a target or a source for any of those policies. So that's the level of integration we support right out of the gate. Yeah, so, so you see this potentially as an enterprise, maybe they've already invested in Ring, maybe looking for something out on the edge that our Tesco would be the, the solution for that. Yeah, we're already seeing opportunities in manufacturers, for example, that have you know small edge deployments, but a hundred plus of them. Uh, the data wouldn't be interesting on its own, but in aggregate, it's great, and they need to filter and replicate that back to the core. So the combination makes a lot of sense in that world. 
That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is where I jump in, I suppose. Um, so we have a final uh, activity for our actual tech media audience on the Inexpo link. Um, we're going to be giving away what you see on your screen. This is a ProLiant DL380 uh, server from HPE. Um, don't forget, if you are the winner, you do have to submit to Actual Tech Media a completed Form W-9, and prize rules and conditions are available at actualtechmedia.com. And our winner is Brady Wilson from Oregon. Brady will be reaching out to you after today's event with information on how to collect your server. Excellent. Well, that's really exciting. Uh, congratulations, Brady. Uh, as someone who has one of these servers, uh, they are pretty great. Um, so thank you everyone for this uh, great, great presentation and discussion. Uh, again, I'm Stephen Foskett, organizer of Tech Field Day, and uh, with Scott Lowe, the two of us have uh, sort of shared today's presentation with, of course, HPE and Scality. And we're so glad that so many people could join us both on the actual tech platform as well as in the Tech Field Day channels. Uh, if you missed any portion of this, I have it on good authority that the entire presentation will be rebroadcast in the future. Also, the Tech Field Day portion, uh, which is the last hour that you've just seen, will be posted on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash techfieldday, and you can catch any parts that you might have missed. I particularly recommend checking out that wonderful DevOps discussion with uh, James and Joey, as well as the fantastic... Uh, user interface demo from Candida. So those will be posted uh, in just a couple of days. If you go to youtube.com slash techfieldday, click subscribe, you can uh, be notified when those things are posted. I would also love to suggest that you check out some more uh, information about this product. If you go to scality.com slash artesca, you can find a lot more information. The team has been busy working on this for a long time. They've prepared tons of uh, backup material and all of it is gonna be posted right there. And of course you can reach out to Scality. But I wanted to give the final word now to Jerome to wrap up our special launch. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Scott. I mean, this has been amazing. Uh, we're extremely excited. First of all, I would like to thank everyone who's been watching now for two hours. So that's quite a lot of your time that you've given us, thank you. And I want to say we are very aware that this is just the beginning of the conversation. We see Artesca as a revolutionary product. We really think that we are changing the landscape for storage. That it's going to be very, very important. And we're going to continue developing and improving this product with all of your comments and feedback. So please reach out to us. Um, read all the documents that we published today. We, there's quite a few of them on our website, so don't hesitate and reach out to us to continue the conversation and potentially to buy the product. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, well, I'm gonna call that a close. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, from uh, me, uh, Stephen Foskett, organizer of Tech Field Day, I really want a special thanks out to the delegates uh, who participated in the discussion today, uh, to James and Joey, uh, to the folks from HPE, and of course, to the folks from Scality. So, uh, thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us.